So, I hope um, that you are ready now for something completely different. Um, let me first introduce where I'm from. So, I'm from the Technical University uh, of uh, Dortmund, and I'm running one of the four competence centers in Germany for machine learning. And I'm the leader of the Collaborative Research Center, where Ten years ago, we started with the idea, or I wanted to bring uh, machine learning and hardware close together. So that's maybe the common uh, interest that we all share, um, that I said that this uh, classic view of computer science, that hardware is something completely different from software, um, that's not true, and we should bring that together. So that was the idea um, ten years ago, and there are two um, projects in the Collaborative Research Center that we do together with physics, in particular one with astrophysics in which I am involved and uh, one with uh, the sand people of particle physics. Okay, so that's the background and now I just present you some research issues of machine learning. And that's the overview of the talk. So there is, I start with applications of machine learning in physics and then move on to show you what I think that machine learning really is. Because uh, there is a lot of applications of machine learning which I consider not really machine learning. So I try to make that clear by first an overview of machine learning and then some examples that uh, should uh, illustrate what I mean by this. And then in the end I come to the easing model um, where I think that could be closest related to quantum learning. Okay. So let's start with machine learning in Cherenkov astronomy. Uh, that's where I've been working for quite a while. And that is um, first uh, starting with the Cherenkov telescopes on uh, La Palma. And uh, there is one additional to the two that you see there. Uh, that is fact and it is partially owned by the Technical University of uh, Dortmund. So that we have access not only at the data but also at the data gathering our the sensors. So what we uh, get there as data is uh, extremely high volume data and um, so it is about 180 uh, megabyte per second so that actually we have to in a way to filter already while the data arrives so we have to do at least the application of learned models in real time and real time here is uh, really fast then we have an extremely skewed distribution so there is only one gamma ray to a thousand hadrons and so machine learning is really challenged. That's why I like this application first, because this is a challenge that we normally don't have. And the other good thing is that uh, there are no privacy issues with gamma rays. So we could, uh, so for teaching, I always use these data sets because then students can do whatever they want. Okay, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to have machine learning at every step of the experiment. So already at calibration of the sensors, already at cleaning, at the feature extraction, the signal separation, the energy estimation. So that at each of these steps we wanted to introduce machine learning and we had to do that in a framework that is made for real-time analysis of data streams. And not on big large stored data but on those that are really just coming and there is this uh, famous uh, architecture of, um, of Lambda, it is called, because on the one hand you have the big data. Uh, I, had, uh, I had a pointer, I know that I had a pointer. Right, and I have it. So there is on the one hand the Hadoop and, and, and uh, the big stored data, and on the other hand you have the streaming data. And for that, we have developed our own software environment called the Streams. And uh, we have the tools for the FACT telescope. And there we have Streams extension and distribute processing and so on. So we have on the same, 
way the stream processing and the large file processing. So this is a nice way to do it with this computing architecture and we had a compute cluster and this lumber architecture is well known to combine batch and stream things. So we have made these uh, fact tools that are collaboratively developed by the physics department and the computer science department. And what you then need on top of that is you need uh, machine learning theory. Because without the theory, it is not guaranteed that the results are really reliable. And if we do science, we need that. So what I'm saying is, at all the levels, we need to have a theoretical uh, foundation. So normally what is done is you have the theoretical guarantees at the level of statistics. So you have the statistical formula, and you have the guarantees that come along with it and all these nice mathematical proofs and that's it. And then comes the algorithms. Mm -hmm -hmm. Maybe they are not so well um, theoretically founded. And then comes uh, uh, the underlying software hardware architecture. And what, what I really want for science is that we have all the levels, all the different levels uh, theoretically well organized. That means there is a theory of machine learning that, uh, that uh, is that you do not only refer to the statistical formula, but you also combine that with the algorithm in a way that you say you actually implement on this hardware uh, the formula with the given guarantees. Otherwise, you cannot convert these guarantees from statistics to your particular running program. And um, this is really a problem. So uh, what we did uh, on, on hardware is, I must admit, it is not quantum computing. It is the FPGA. The FPGA is so nice because with that, you model a particular chip. And you can do that and program that on your own way, such that you can have the guarantees, as I said, convert it. So what you have here is the structure of the FPGA and then you can, uh, you can uh, program it directly in a way as if you would design a chip. And then, for instance, we did it with uh, decision trees and random forests and so on. And we investigated um, how efficient that runs on the hardware and whether this would uh, really uh, enhance um, the processing for the Cherenkov telescope. So what we did was we have the theory of random forest from statistics and we have the implementation on a certain special hardware and we want to promote all the guarantees uh, such that in the end we are uh, well empirically also tested which implementation is faster under which conditions and so on. Okay. What the final outcome of all this work that was for about six years or so, uh, was is here you see the full pipeline from the telescope and the um, air showers arriving until the classification of the energy. And you see here that um, uh, the phase of calibration, the image cleaning, another kind of image cleaning, uh, feature extraction, and in the end comes uh, the little classifier step. So if you consider machine learning only the little final step, uh, uh, this is only a very small part of what it actually is. So um, what we did is uh, we had uh, the records uh, 60 events per second, and uh, then it all runs through this pipeline and every single step is uh, well organized, such that we could make an average processing time in milliseconds. Funnily enough, this is all implemented in Java, by the way. Most people think Java cannot be fast, but if you do it right, it can also be fast, as other languages as well. OK, so that is just to, to show you my um, view of where machine learning comes into a particular um, a project <clears throat> and um, that we have to make sure that we 
verify every step. Another um, collaboration that we are uh, working uh, with in the project is IceCube. Again, it is very similar. We have uh, extremely high volume data and um, our machine learning tasks are to form uh, the trace of the neutrino coming uh, through the ice and being measured by these optical elements and then uh, separate it from all the other particles and then estimate the energy. So it is similar. Um, the biggest uh, success, of course, you might know well, uh, is this multi-messenger observation. Uh, that is, of course, very good. If you as well by the ice cube experiment at the South Pole and by the Cherenkov telescopes measure the same thing and can really show that actually these measurements were correct because they both found the same uh, event that is there. Okay, so machine learning, <clears throat> in my view, is an instrument of science. So it is an instrument as all the other instruments are as well. So um, the ground truth cannot be grasped by a human expert in uh, the current data-driven or data-volume-driven uh, experiments. So if you just look at the data, you will not find anything. So actually, you must need a machine that can handle large volume and large dimensional data and that can handle noise or a very biased distribution. And if you do so, and if there is an instrument, it should be clear that you have to calibrate that instrument and that you have to know the properties of that instrument. And what I was surprised several times is that people for a physical instrument accept that you have to work on the calibration and on the feature of it and so on. And if it is software, they simply take it and hack and do not take care whether that has some guarantees or not, or whether it is just a little program with um, unknown features. So uh, what I say is that machine learning digs into data from detectors, lifting insights that were out of reach before, but the learned models must come with proven guarantees of their properties. Yeah, and that's the work that we do. I mean, all my PhD students do exactly that. They have to deliver proven guarantees for things like that. So then just one <laughs> where I'm very proud of, so that is the whole Ice Cube collaboration, and that is me uh, as an author. <laughs> so that's great. Okay. So that is my motivation coming uh, from the physics side, and now let's come to machine learning. And uh, first, let me tell you what I think that machine learning is. It is part of computer science. That means that all the techniques that our students learn for four for years have to be known to understand it. <clears throat> this might raise some doubt. And it is based on data. This will not raise some doubt, I guess. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> uh, here is, so, here you see the, the history of machine learning. It first started with carefully selected data. That was the high time of statistics. They directly work on Excel. And then there were the given data from advertisement from companies and so on. That was uh, high time of database. And then came big data with no SQL. <laughs> and then currently we have the trend to structured data, graphs for instance, and things like that. Okay. And now what I think is very important and uh, the most uh, common trend now is that machine learning is actually delivering an action. So, for instance, in the Cherenkov telescope array, the good thing is because of an error of Cherenkov uh, telescopes, you can use the learned result that there is something important to really act on the field of arrays and do something because of the learning. 
Okay, so um, there are many, many, many uh, frameworks of learning, the induction of decision trees with a very well established theory, support vector machines, uh, clustering, probabilistic graphical models, frequent item set mining, reinforcement learning, neural networks with the new trend of convolution and so on, time series classification, clustering, and um, the list is of course not complete. There are many, many, many ways and we should not just say that there is uh, a temporal order. There is no temporal order. So I, I was really, myself, I was a bit surprised that I'm still working on decision trees. I started with decision trees and now I'm still working with decision trees. So that is not a thing that we now have to do neural networks as we did, uh, as we did 20 years ago. No, they are all there and um, are just all tools in our toolbox. So the view is of um, the interdisciplinary area of data science. Uh, there is this um, uh, <clears throat> diagram that is very often showed. And actually, we have the domain expertise that are the experiments in experimental physics, for instance, or in other experimental sciences. And then uh, you have the analytics uh, uh, with data programming and machine learning and, and, uh, and, and statistics. And all this together gives you a nice uh, uh, composite to actually use it for making science. So, <clears throat> what makes computers learn? We have to know that. And we have to give tight bounds for the correctness and for the efficiency and for the robustness. Robustness here, I mean, uh, if you do little changes in the data, also the model should be changed only a little. It should not be the case that a little change in data, like in uh, deep learning, currently that is the situation. You just change one pixel and out of the blue, a fox becomes a windmill or something, right? It can be completely uh, different. And then fairness is also an important topic, maybe not so much in Chankov telescope, but uh, since uh, fairness has to do with biased distributions, uh, I think that some of these results can be used here as well. And then we have to have methods of inspection of the data and interaction with experts. So all this is um, what we as machine learning people do research on. That's what we do every day. Now let me give a set of examples. and. Of course, then I thought I should give you something on deep learning. But the problem is that although it is so fashionable and although we have many sessions on that, uh, deep learning has not yet the theory that we want. So the research is to achieve a theory, but we do not have it. So I prefer to show you something where just recently we achieved at a sound theory with, that can illustrate all the points that I made. And that is a theory about models of the exponential family class. So exponential families are just one class and there we have probabilistic models. So now the ingredients of a theory is always you need data of a certain type. Here all the observations are um, vectors. It is a realization of a random variable that gives the link to statistic formulas. Then we have a state space of all the values that these uh, uh, components of the vector can take. And we have the probability of an event, of a particular event. And then we want to predict probabilities from the data. That is, we estimate the probability density. And there are many, many, many uh, algorithms like topic models and embeddings and all this. And we do supervised prediction in the discriminative models. Um, and uh, there we state uh, the maximum likelihood given the observations and we have a prediction. Okay. So why are exponential families so very interesting? They are so interesting because the sufficient statistic aggregates the data. And if we have so many, and if we are 
moving beyond Excel, then we need something how to aggregate the data. That is, we have this mapping of the data and that gives us the sufficient statistics and the other thing is that the dimension of this mapping is finite and it is independent of the dimension of the data and uh, of, of the number of data. So that means if we are in terms of the exponential family, as Pittman has shown, 1936, then we stay in a space that we can handle. That's the important thing about it. Okay, so that's why Markov random fields have become quite uh, interesting. They have the probability distribution that can be factorized into positive functions defined on the clicks of nodes and links between them. And uh, that was another important uh, theorem that we can do so. So now let's see, we have these uh, graphical models. And um, as I said, we map the observations as they come into a d-dimensional space of real numbers, for instance, or sometimes not real numbers. Then we have to learn the par uh, parameters that give weight to everything of that. And uh, there is a supervised version of it, the conditional random fields. And here you see that this normalization thingy uh, can be moved into the overall um, expression here and if you do so then I abbreviate in the following this term that comes from here by like this uh -huh, comes here I abbreviate it just by a of the theta vector of the parameters right so that's what I'm doing such that we have an easy readability. So in the end here, we have this expression and with the Markov random field, we do not have the label. So it is a bit easier in, in writing, but it is much more powerful because it is uh, a generative model, um, but it is easier in writing. And here again, I write it uh, such that the uh, log partition function A is actually this, okay? So now that you know all the ingredients, and now we have to see what we can do with them. So here, this is the representation. So here you have actually all the nodes with their particular states, and then here you have all the edges, and that gives you then the whole dimensionality, and maybe we just have it binary in a discrete random field. And then you have here the mapping, and here you have the probability that you want to calculate, because so one special case of this, and this is the one that I, uh, I'll come back to later, is the easing model from physics. That's, uh, sure. Uh, so, and there it is a restricted model. So it does not have all the guarantees that uh, probabilistic graphical models have. It is a bit restricted, but it, uh, because it exploits a particular structure, um, of the nodes and the weights uh, between them, uh, of the edges and uh, particular values. And uh, so this structure is exploited by all this for a hierarchical classification because it is actually about uh, uh, magnetic uh, processes. Okay, so if we do inference with the probabilistics and we want to learn something and we want to propagate something, then we first calculate the marginal probabilities. What is, if you have the particular value of a variable, then the partition function, you can consider an integral. And then the maximum a posteriori state that gives you the probability that you would like to um, uh, to hand out as a result, for instance. So the complexity of computing the partition function depends on the hardness of the integration. A closed form is known for Gaussian, Poisson, Laplace, Weibull distribution. So for some distribution, that means you have to look up whether for your distribution that you are dealing with, you actually have uh, 
such a solution or not. Then for discrete random variables, belief propagation is efficient if you have a tree structured graph. So, okay, now you know what the exponential family is and we come now to something which is called regularization or reparameterization and reparameterization and this can be made uh, easily um, illustrated by this picture. So what we have here are some measurements and uh, what you could do is you could say uh, I learn this curve from these measurements but you could also learn this from these measurements and um, well um, of course <laughs> what you then afterwards, after learning, what you get is additional points that you didn't see before and you want to predict in terms of the additional points later on. So what you see here is the problem of how dense should the model be and how complex should the model be in order to best work for the previously unseen uh, observations. So, Regularization decreases the model complexity, so we have the norms L1 or L2, or mixtures of that, and reparameterization maps the parameters to another space. And maybe in this other space we can see things that we could not realize in the original uh, space. So, for instance, we can have a vector delta with a smaller dimension that is a reparameterization of the original uh, theta. So, so that we have a mapping from k to d back again and if we have that then it should be again the same parameters that we had before. So that's also what I mean by guarantees. So there are many papers where you'll find a nice vector that is a reparameterization, but you cannot map it back. So, in a way, what does it mean? Okay, and then, um, so, what I want to say is that if you change the number of parameters, then you also change the independent structure that is behind the structure of your probability graphical model. And, and, and that is something that is very often forgotten and then hmm, you do not know what you really got. So there is, is one particular model that we worked on and which is very successful for a lot of data that is spatial temporal random fields where we actually have a level of a spatial random field and we stack time point after time point linking the observation with the corresponding observation of the next and because we always propagate with the neighbors we also propagate from here to the to the neighbors in the next time point and so for instance you can have that as week or days or whatever the time intervals are that you are interested in and so if you know that the edges here and there uh, represent Always is about to represent um, a common state space, then you may share the parameters and then you have less parameters without losing information. And there was this very important proof that the distance between the true parameters and the estimated ones on the mapping is bounded and the sparsity in the estimate really implies redundancies in the true parameters. So that is, of course, the proof takes some pages. I will not tell it about here, but that is what I consider important for applying a method in a scientific concept. Before you have this proof, you cannot rely on the results. That's uh, the claim, and here is an example. So, Keeping the quality, we could do regularization and reparameterization, saving memory and learning becoming very much faster. So, well, I make it I just show you the main idea is that if you have the time, then little changes probably do not really change anything that you want to learn. So that as I made 
clear by these pictures so that in a way you compress. But here we could show by proof and by empirical that it doesn't change uh, uh, the truth. Now come to another more severe uh, change of what we did and that is we did graphical models on resource restricted processors. Now that is again something with hardware and software so that we have for some applications ultra low power devices and they do not even have floating, floating point operators such that all our calculation of probabilistic graphical models need to be done in integer. Not only the result turned to integers but all the calculation because the little hardware cannot deal with something else. Of course this also has, uh, if we only calculate with integer, it has a, um, a less consumption of cycles and that means it consumes less energy. So in terms of climate change we all also have to take care that our computation is not taking too much energy. Therefore we are looking for the most complex model, which are probabilistic graphical models, do them on ultra low power devices. And so how could we do that? Well, we restricted the parameter space of Markov random fields um, to a set of capital K uh, parameters and not more. Now, and now we do 2 to the power of, instead of the original formula that I explained, we now have 2 to the power of this. So we have this now as uh, the basic mapping and then if we do that, this is of course not sufficient because it would give you an overflow in the numerical uh, calculation. So just simply reducing the exponential family to the 2 to the power is not sufficient. What you have to do is you have to handle the overflow somehow. You have to do normalization which is impossible because you divide and you get a real number in integer division. So and there Niko Piatkowski made an excellent observation. He found out that actually what you do is believe propagation. So all the nodes propagate their probabilities to the neighbor nodes. That's what you actually do. Hmm. And then when observing that you see that the length of the messages that propagate is already similar to the log and you can use the bit length. And the bit length of course is integer. So you, he found that actually if you just look at the length of each message you have an indication of the probability. And with that idea he could show that there is a closed form proximal operator to integer regularization and that then means that we now have a novel integer gradient descent algorithm and this algorithm comes with some guarantees but now only guarantees of the approximation quality. So as you see in this picture you see that there are some things that cannot be done in the new um, integer calculation that could be done in uh, the full calculation. But um, the approximation error depends on the number of neighboring nodes and the space of states and then you can calculate how good this approximation is and then some of the probabilities cannot be expressed as you see in the picture. But what you also see in another picture is that actually um, so you have the clear bound and what you then have is you see that in, in reality um, this would be 95% uh, of accuracy, this is 85% of accuracy and then we had different large k's and what you see is uh, that the accuracy is, 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 is quite well even uh, if you have 8,000 nodes and I said the quality depends on the number of nodes that's in the proof and so here this is of course the worst result in accuracy because you have 8,000 nodes and, but, but it is still 
above 85%. And this is uh, the, the real MRF is now taken as 100% of accuracy. So you see exactly what the approximation is and you have bounds on that. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about models and hardware demands. Here we took the most complex uh, probabilistic graphical models and then we have seen the resource demands of the model and we have seen that we could uh, do a small memory, that was my first example. Now we see we can even handle uh, uh, restricted uh, computing um, capabilities so that we have very little energy consumed. So in a way that was all done by the resource demands of the models by parameters and redundancies. So, but actually there is still, so we worked on that, but still, still there is some um, problem. And that is the third exercise, I make it a bit short here. So that is now the calculation of the partition function. So in general, evaluating this partition function is P space complete. Hmm. So that's too bad. And then numerical approximate integration is based on general quadrature. So what uh, there is done is you replace the function for, of the integral by another one and then you uh, need to determine the particular uh, uh, values. And then which other function should that be that should be in this case uh, Chebyshev polynomial because there are ni some nice uh, theoretical work on the behavior of that. And then you do the Chebyshev interpolation and then, the, in a way, what you do is, from the difficult integral computation, you split it into two, case, into two cases. And the one case can be pre-computed, and the other is fast. And then you can really use a very fast version on your real-time uh, um, processes. And uh, here is just the complexity and the quality of the different known things. And these are the ones uh, developed by Diko Piatkowski with his uh, uh, very intensive theoretical results. So, what you get is you get a scalability that the runtime in uh, seconds here and the number of CPUs is scaling well and um, you can easily make the algorithm parallel. So what you get is you can really do very heavy data streams that you get from astrophysical data. So ha, in the end I'm, I'm back again uh, uh, to what you might be uh, more interested in. So, that was my illustration of what machine learning research looks like. So we, the machine learning people, we do not just click on some tools, but we develop a theory, the theory of machine learning. That's what we do all the day, I mean. So now what I illustrated that by probabilistic graphical models, and uh, what we have to do there is we have tight bounds for quality while reducing memory, energy, and runtime, and we have theoretically well-based and not heuristic results, such that other scientists can rely on these methods. They are carefully implemented such that others can rely on it. So with the carefully implemented, there are lots of stories. If you look into the code of TensorFlow, you find nice comments like, this is not actually true. I know that this is a bug, but I have no time to correct it. And then I see other people just using it, but I mean, that is not at all guaranteed then. Um, you need to make sure that also the implementation on the proper hardware is uh, uh, correct. And then, you, of course, then you empirically test it on several data sets. So now come to what I found could be the bridge to the topic of this year's uh, fall meeting of uh, physics, and that is the easing model. That's why I have 
introduced it carefully at the beginning, it could be considered a kind of quantum annealing maybe. And when I looked then at quantum computing, which uh, uh, I didn't do before, I must admit, it was only in preparation for this fall meeting, and then I came to something which I like very much in uh, uh, computer science, that is that we have the never-ending uh, books. So, uh, for instance, there is a book on quantum computing that you can uh, that you can uh, always access on the internet and it is written all the time so it can be changed, it can be enhanced and so on and uh, I think that it's a good idea to have uh, books kind of living and there is a definition and um, well in the coffee break we can discuss about it I, I, I find it uh, funny they say a quantum computer is a device that takes data as input and does some sort of operations on the data which requires the use of quantum physics to describe this process. So only the description is physical. Hmm. Okay. And then programming a quantum computer uh, comes along with some restrictions. So classical computers will be preferable in cases where there is no particular quantum advantage to be found. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's what they say. Well, now, I know that the field is much broader, and I only, and this is just my uh, huge uh, amount of things I do not know about quantum computing, so that I focus on a very small fraction of what it all is about. So just on the annealing, uh, where we have this uh, interesting quantum uh, tunneling effect such that we have the start with the superposition of all possible states with their weights, now I call them J, and uh, the other way of the links, so we have the node weights and the edge weights as we had before, and we interpolate weights to actual optimization program according to some annealing schedule with the time uh, uh, for this annealing uh, from zero to T such that we have this minimization uh, problem and here the A is not the A that we have seen before but it is the annealing A and then here is what we have seen before already in a way such that this is quite similar to um, members of the exponential family such that we have the link to what we have seen before. And then the only hardware I knew until this conference was the one, so when we uh, visited uh, the NASA, they said that we are allowed to use their quantum computer, they said. Ha. And then the quantum computer is not actually a quantum computer, but it is this deep wave uh, uh, thingy. And um, so it has some characteristics of that. And then we thought, okay, the easing model is, um, here you have binary variables arranged in a lattice. There are interactions between, that's, these are the edges. So what you have is very similar to what we have just seen. You have here the nodes and the edges between them and you have the nodes alone. And then you have this Hamiltonian function H. And here you have minus one and plus one, okay. Um, that's a bit different. And then we can do the mapping between the icing model and the uh, quadratic um, binary optimization and then you can see that this is really equivalent. I mean, of course you have here the difference, you have to do the mapping, mm -hmm. but you can do that. And then what you then see, if you do that mapping from, then you can have here the Markov random fields with their representation of the sufficient statistics. And here you have the constraint binary optimization and the constraint is just here that within this variable you cannot have both having uh, with the one. It must be one and not the other. So this is indicating a constraint for the different variables. So in a way you can uh, have here one variable with k states and here you have k variable with two states. 
and then that is the map pin and that means that we can now take all our results that we had for Markov random fields. Now we can use them because this formula can now, here we have this, this is our mapping for the sufficient statistics, this is our old A from the Markov random fields and now we see that they actually are uh, based on the same ground and if we have that then we can now go a step further we have an NP hard optimization uh, problem that is used in many many uh, algorithms and we have put that on another hardware we have put that on the FPGAs that uh, I have introduced already because well there is this D-Wave computer mm, that's fine um, but um, it has a problem with too many variables. Now I have learned there is some work on it and maybe that problems will disappear if we have a true uh, quantum computer. And the power consumption of the D-Way is incredibly large. It's, it's really, I mean, can you imagine 25,000 watts? So, and then we have an uncertainty when regarding the solution. So, we thought, hmm, maybe we prepare for something that is similar to the quantum annealing, but we do that on another hardware, and that is this FPGA, uh, where you can do classical parallel programming that is highly parallel, then we have low power consumption, well, it is some work for us, so this minus only means that uh, uh, Sasha Mücke had to do a lot of work <laughs> in order uh, to, to program that. But we could then do a specialized FPGA implementation of uh, Easing model or Cubo. And if you look at that, then you see that the power consumption here is for the same problem of quantum annealing. Uh, the power consumption at D-Wave is like that, at GPUs it's like that, at CPUs it's like that, and this is what you need in energy if you do FPGA. Just for comparison, this is the energy an LED light bulb is using. So we can do a very heavy optimization problem using less energy than a light bulb. And so, and it is actually uh, Converging, that's what we always uh, show. So, with this, I come to an end. And uh, of course, the message is clear. Uh, I think that we should work together. And uh, so, I said what I think machine learning is it is an instrument of science and a science in its own right because it has an own theory. It is a theory of the bounds of the properties of our methods so that we have model compression to reduce the space, reduced energy consumption to reduce the energy of course, and then scalability to reduce the runtime. And uh, the current quantum annealers that I know or knew uh, are consuming too much energy and therefore be oriented towards quantum computing and taking uh, the Cubo optimization problem, but we implemented that on an uh, FPGA. Yeah, that's it. <laughs>